Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, North Suburban Evanston made history as the first U.S. city to make reparations available to its black residents. We'll talk about the local and national outlook. Her first book was The What. Now her second book is The How. Chicago author Lovie Ajayi Jones joins us for this week's Black Voices Book Club selection. Longtime Chicago broadcaster Bill Campbell died last week at age 70. We'll hear some of his thoughts on the job in a 1981 throwback. We go all over, okay, if you can't get out. Now if you can get out, then we'll tell you where to meet us. And arts correspondent Angel Edo on a community organization serving groceries to artists in need. First off tonight, Evanston has become the first city in the country to offer reparations for black residents, 144 years since the end of Reconstruction. Last week, Evanston Alderman voted to distribute $10 million over the next 10 years using tax money from the sale of recreational marijuana. It starts with distributing $400,000 to eligible black households. Those who qualify can receive $25,000 for home repairs, interest or late penalties owed to the city, or down payments on property. At the city council meeting, Alderman Robin Rue Simmons said this housing program is just the start of Evanston's reparations plan. It's the first tangible step. It is alone not enough. It is not full repair alone in this in this one initiative. But we we all know that um, the road to repair and justice in the black community is going to be a, a generation of work. Um, it's going to be um, many programs and initiatives and more funding. And joining us to discuss this historic legislation are historian Morris Dino Robinson, founder of the Shorefront Legacy Center, Cam Howard with the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, or INCOBRA, and community organizer Sebastian Knowles. Thanks to the three of you for joining us this evening. So, uh, Dino Robinson, let's start with you, please. You advised Evanston City Council's uh, reparations subcommittee on the history of the black community there in Evanston, in particular about housing disparities. Remind us of what that history is and explain its impact on today's black Evanstonians. Sure. Evanston was established about uh, 1855 as a uh, city or, or village at the time. Um, and in Evanston's early history, there was no sense of uh, or a borderline of what an African-American community was. Uh, everybody in Evanston lived everywhere. But there was a mark, uh, demark after 1900 that showcased where Blacks were being pushed into one area of Evanston. And that took over a course of about 30 years to see the major impact of that. And they used that, used zoning, uh, the Hope maps uh, that came out with the federal government, and also Jim Crow policies that were not necessarily in the books, but were a practice part of social life. So over the course of 30 years, uh, from a well-diverse community, the Black community specifically was targeted and pushed into one area of Evanston. Now, Evanston City Council, they passed this ordinance by a vote of eight to one. That one lone vote came from Alderman Cicely Fleming. She explained to Chicago tonight uh, last week that she is not anti-reparations, but she does have a specific objection to calling this plan reparations. Here's what she said. We used to have, before I was on council, a first-time home buyers program here in Evanston. So it wasn't just for African-Americans, but similarly helps you with down payment and such. Um, and so my issue with that under the banner of reparations is that I don't think that that's reparations. I think that's the housing plan. This money will be transferred from the city of Evanston to a bank on your behalf. And I think the idea that African-Americans had no, or will be able to have kind of really no um, input on how this money is spent is kind of really, in my opinion, contradictory to reparations. It's supposed to be 
kind of atoning and healing and bringing people together. And it's really telling people, hey, we've decided what's best for you and it's housing. And so we're going to give the money to the bank. And Sebastian Knowles, your group opposes this reparations plan as well. Tell us why, please. So I want to start off and say that our group doesn't oppose reparations as a whole. Uh, we believe that reparations are the correct thing to do here in the nation. Uh, but this current program as it stands is not reparations. And I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Alderman Fleming says, is that these social equity programs are not uh, reparations. The fact that $25,000 are going to 16 individuals or eight families in total, and they can't even come together to spend that money uh, they have no say in this matter. They can't choose what to do with their money. They can't put it into their black business if they want to, or save for education for their child. That they're focused solely on housing and the money's going directly to the banks. Those are the, some of the problems we have with the program. Now, Cam Howard, your organization uh, is working towards winning or has been working towards winning reparations uh, for over 30 years. Do you believe this is the right step that Evanston is taking or would cash payments be better? Absolutely, this is the right step. Uh, we uh, fundamentally disagree with everything that the Alderman Fleming stated, as well as Seb Sebastian. Uh, they do not have a correct overview of what, a full view of what reparations is. And reparations really is any resources targeted toward, specifically toward Black people for the legacy of crimes committed during the period of enslavement, Jim Crow segregation, or post-Jim Crow era. And so this is a housing initiative that is a reparations housing initiative. And so there will be other compensation type initiatives around the country, other educational reparations, reparations initiatives, and other uh, healthcare reparations initiative. This is a housing reparations initiative. And we think that it will be a model for the federal government to use. When federal dollars come down, we'll be able to have an opportunity to see whether or not uh, this had an impact and how we can expand uh, this particular initiative uh, nationwide. Dino Robinson, you also helped create the Reparations Stakeholders Authority of Evanston. That's a team of residents um, who will help expand reparations work. Uh, what are the goals of this group? Well, this is a forming group. We're not yet formalized, and this is going to take a lot more conversations with community members. But the intent on this is because we understood the limitations of the uh, $10 million proposed by the city of Evanston. With their program, they're focused on housing, according to the resolutions, housing, economic development, and educational initiatives. Those are the three taps on there. Um, but what's missing are other elements. You know, people do talk about the cash payouts, uh, health and mental wellness, and other issues that are important to the African-American community here in Evanston. So what this attempts to do is address a, for, uh, a format where the community, the harm community could has, has a say in where reparations monies can go to um, through a, a a private fund that's held at the Evanston Community Foundation. So this needs to be community ran, where the community sets a precedent of what is done with that money. Sebastian Knowles, based on what we just heard from Dino Robinson, and because Alderman uh, Simmons has said that this is just a first step, um, this housing program represents a small portion of the money. Does that uh, resolve any of the concerns uh, that your group has that more is on the way? Do you, does that help at all? with your concerns? No, it doesn't. Uh, I've been asking this question for the past couple months now is what is the next step? Uh, and and we go in this plan and we say, you know, if you create a plan or you build a house, uh, you don't build the kitchen first and decide to build a bedroom next year or the bathroom uh, two years down the line. Uh, this plan was never flushed out and we don't know what the next step is. I had a conversation with Alderman Braithwaite a few weeks back. Uh, and I asked, what are the next steps of this program? And he said, ultimately, it's up to the next reparations committee, the next city council to decide that. You don't create a plan and market it as reparations without having that next step. And what has happened is that communities and municipalities across the nation are gonna be looking at this housing program and this housing program only as a model for the nation to follow. And that's why it's so incredibly dangerous because this housing program cannot work in Mississippi or it cannot work in deep South Georgia. Uh, it may work here in Evanston, and we should call it a housing program, but it's not true reparations. Uh, Dino Robinson, you know, about 16% of, uh, sorry, I wanted to go to Cam Howard. There are, you know, we've just heard uh, arguments that this is not enough, but it, this is being considered uh, potentially a model nationwide. Cam Howard, lay out for us what 
does reparations look like elsewhere? What could it look like nationwide? Well, on a local level, it's going to be some, some, similar to Evanston, where you're going to have a limited amount of resources targeted toward a particular area. In this case, it's housing. It can be um, business development at their next uh, distri distribution of, of resources. But it's going to look different in every community locally because uh, and every community has its own challenges. And it's up to the community to prioritize whatever its challenges are and where it wants to direct its resources. In Evanston, the priority was uh, housing. Uh, the next initiative, again, may be something else, and that's for the subcommittee to determine. But we are sure that what we're seeing in Evanston can be utilized around the country. One of the things that uh, happened in Evanston that doesn't happen anywhere else is that Evanston chose to uh, determine a dollar amount prior to developing a plan. Most other cities have a commission type of of a plan where they develop a commission, the commission develops the proposals, and then they go and fund them. Mm -hmm. Evanston and took a different, unique route where the money was like initially, and that is what makes this such an, a novel uh, And obviously plan. it sounds like there's a, a lot of work uh, to be done, uh, both in Evanston and around the country. That is where we'll have to leave it though. My thanks to Dino Robinson, Sebastian Knowles, and Cam Howard for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Longtime Chicago broadcaster Bill Campbell died earlier this month at age 70. Many Chicagoans remember Campbell's distinctive voice from his stint as the host of Chicagoing on WLS or his many times hosting the Bud Billiken Parade broadcast. But when he appeared with Week in Review in 1981, he was editorial director at WLS, delivering views of station management on issues of the day. In this throwback from that year, Campbell talks with host Joel Wiseman about his signature on-location editorials and deriving meaning from his work. People ask me, they say, why does television uh, have to be kind of go out of its way to be on location? And I know your editorials are almost exclusively on location. Uh, what difference does it make if you're standing in front of the sanitary district uh, as opposed to just talking about it? Well, maybe not the sanitary district as an example, Joel, but certainly something happened in the community. Uh, we started uh, Channel 7 editorializing on location about four years ago and have found it to be an effective way of utilizing the media that we all are, are working with. And certainly if you're in a community, you're talking about an issue that's occurring there and you interact with people who are in the community, they have a feeling that more than pontificating on an issue, you're actually they're concerned and its workforce. Let me ask you this, what uh, has been the most satisfying uh, editorial or editorial campaign that you've been involved in that has uh, brought about uh, some change in accordance with your recommendation? One that's very visual, it's a great illustration of this point, we didn't discuss it before, is the breakwater off the Oak Street Beach. Uh, last year uh, there was a very tragic accident where uh, a young couple were killed because they ran into the breakwater at night, they were experienced builders. <laughs> Uh, and we decided that there should be lights on this breakwater. Uh, I guess over the past 15 years, something like six or seven people have been killed in similar accidents. Uh, we researched it, found out that nobody wanted to accept responsibility for it. Senator Percy got involved, uh, and just the opening of this boating season, the breakwater has. Well, lights. now you say we decided that there should be lights there. How did, how did we? Did you know about this? Did you? see this story on the news and say can't we avoid this or did your we, general manager we saw the story we got calls from the family uh, who had also tried to do something about it why aren't there lights up there it's a very dangerous navigational situation and why not From jumping out of perfectly good flying airplanes to zip lining through a jungle, the author of this week's Black Voices Book Club selection has become an expert at challenging your fears, but not all of her daring adventures involve leaving the ground. She was initially afraid to give her own 2017 TED Talk, Get Comfortable with Being Uncomfortable, which is now closing in on 6 million views. She's clearly gotten over that fear, and she's here to help us do the same with her new book, Professional Troublemaker, The Fear Fighter Manual. Joining us now is author, Chicagoan, Lovey Ajayi-Jones. Welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Thanks for joining us. We're glad you're here. 
Thank you for having me. So you've been, you know, talking about being a professional troublemaker. You mentioned it in that 2017 TED Talk, which has been viewed a lot. Uh, but your first book was I'm Judging You, The Do Better Manual. Why now for the professional troublemaker book? Yes, you know, my book, Professional Troublemaker, is a fear fighter manual. And I think right now it's really urgent because we are living in a world that is scarier than I've ever, I think. And I think right now what we need are more people to be professional troublemakers. And what that means is they're disruptors for good. So they're the people who are in the meeting who say, you know what, have we thought about this campaign? They're the family member who points out the bad joke your uncle makes. They're the friend who's telling you, let's have a tough conversation. I think professional troublemakers are the people who are elevating every room that they're in and we need them to exist. So I wanna affirm them. And if you are not one, I want to convince you to become one. That's, that's a tough sell. Um, so you're inspired a lot by the head professional troublemaker uh, in your life, your grandmother. Tell us uh, about her and, and why she inspires you. Yes, my grandmother for me was the person who I looked at who gave me permission to be a bold woman. She took up space without apology. She allowed herself to be celebrated. My grandmother was kind, but she didn't take any of your stuff, okay? And she was so deeply loved. And what I didn't realize I was doing was watching how she was moving through the world and learning that I could also do the same thing and be this person. So yeah, this book is dedicated to Mama Faloyi who passed 10 years ago. So this is actually an amazing tribute for her. And she didn't take any stuff, which is a very nice word for something we can't say on Sunday night television. Um, right. <laughs> you immigrated from Nigeria with your family at a young age, at nine, um, and you write about how that was something to overcome for you. But in what ways was, you know, overcoming that also your superpower? Yeah. You know, coming to, from, from Nigeria to the United States, I was the first, it was the first time I was a new girl anywhere. I was different for the first time. My name was different. The way I sounded was different. But I, you know, I adapted as kids do, and you don't want to be different at nine. But I think when I got to college and at the University of Illinois, and I got to see everybody kind of own their culture in a real way, I was like, there's no reason for me not to own my Nigerianness. And I think my Nigerianness is one of my superpowers because it informs how I write, how I speak, how I approach the world. We're very bravado filled people. And I think oftentimes the thing that makes us feel that we are too much or that we're too different is a thing we have to double down on because it's something that is a competitive advantage. In the book, uh, you write about the Oriki, and I hope I'm saying it correctly. I'm from Mississippi. You are, you Thank are. Thank you, good. Um, tell us what that is and why, why you need one. So an Oriki is from traditional Yoruba land. I'm a Yoruba girl from Nigeria. And it is something that ties you to your lineage and your family, and it kind of affirms your very being. I call it a standing ovation for your spirit. And it is something that I think everybody needs because we are in this world being told all the time that we're not enough or that we're too something or that we need to change something that's core to ourselves. And an oriki is exact opposite. It's saying that you are amazing just as you are today. Do you know who you are? Like, can't nobody touch you. Can't nobody say nothing to you. Can't nobody say nothing about you. So I think it's important for us all to write ourselves orikis. So fun exercise, how does one do this? This is sort of an exercise yes. that you give readers of the book um, and you wrote your own and you liken it to if, you know, Game of Thrones fans will, uh, will know the one that is often given to uh, Daenerys Targaryen. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm vamping while you find your page, yeah. but go on. <laughs> yeah, when you think of how they used to introduce Daenerys, every single time you heard her introduced, you felt high, hyped on her behalf. Queen of the Andals, mother of dragons. You know, she was a protector of the seven realms. And I think all of us need to have it. And I created one for myself. And mine is Lovey of House Jones, first of her name, assassin of the alphabet, bestseller of books, conqueror of copy, dame of diction. That's like half of what I wrote. But I want everybody to write one for themselves. I think you need to have it in these moments when somebody tells you something that makes you feel diminished or a bad day that you had, or when you wanna do something big like ask for a promotion, read that thing and let it gas you up. All right, um, so why uh, troublemaking, I guess? You know, you, you talked about this a little bit, but you know, how is the advice that you're giving folks, how is it uh, troublesome? See, I think trouble is actually a good thing. Think about the late great John Lewis who said, we need to be ready to make necessary good trouble. Usually trouble is some anything that's disrupting what's happening in the room. And what's happening in the room is often not okay. So if it means making good trouble, means telling the truth, 
It means asking for somebody's voice to be heard when it was previously not. It means using your power in service, in service of other people. And I think making trouble is a good thing. We need to reclaim the word trouble. In this world that is a dumpster fire, making trouble is a good thing. So uh, you just wrapped your book tour. I wanted to ask you this before we let you get out of here. Uh, there was a sort of kindness train that formed on your book tour. Tell me about that and, and how it got started. The kindness train has touched my spirit. When I announced my book tour, a lot of people were like, oh, I can't afford to come. Other people saw comments in my social from people who couldn't afford to come and said, oh, I'll buy you a ticket. I'll buy you another ticket. Through there, over a thousand comments 500 people who said they couldn't afford tickets, 500 other people bought their tickets. And then my friends picked up the mantle and said, I'd buy 100 tickets. We ended up giving away over 1,900 tickets, which meant 1,900 books in my book tour. And it went to frontline workers, moms who need a break, social workers, anybody who just could not come. And for me, I think that's one of the best things that have come out of this whole book tour, this whole book launch is that people really showed up for each other and showed that community is a verb. Paying it forward. Our thanks to Levy Ajayi Jones for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Again, the book is called Professional Troublemaker, the Fear Fighter Manual. For more on how to fight your fears and write your own Ariki, you can visit our website, wttw.com slash voices. Up next, a community organization helping artists in need. A Chicago artist is working to make sure no musician is left behind with a community organization dedicated to black musicians in Chicago. Arts correspondent Angel Edo shares, recently shared how that mission has expanded to serve anyone in need. Here's another look. It was God sent to me to be able to do something for some musicians that can't play. They can't sing. They can't appear in clubs. They can't tour. I know how that feels because of me not being able to sing for two years. I was homeless. I ate out of garbage cans. And I just decided that because life, music has been my life, I know how these musicians are feeling. And I had to do something. It was on her birthday last October when Chicago artist Holly V. Maxwell decided to create Black Musicians Matters. With help from community partners like Guardian Interest Security Company, the group delivers food on a weekly basis. They won't reach out because they have so much pride. So what I do is I just go and call them and ask them, do you need something? I need musicians, Chicago musicians to know, please get in touch with us. We will come to you if you can't get out. We covered the west side. We went to Melrose Park. We went to Oak Park. Oh yeah, we go to the hundreds. With donations from GoFundMe, the group is also able to provide monetary support for artists like bass guitar player Joe Pratt, who was the band director at the East Odyssey Lounge before the pandemic hit. A big box of food, I was given money, and that came in handy. At the time, I really, really needed it because, you know, bills need to be paid. Musicians Charles Crane and Jimmy Burns have also received support. I had to pay my cell phone bill, and uh, it was right on time. Take my word on it. And I love apples. They gave me a fresh apples. This is what's going on. It's been helping me tremendously. I, get... <laughs> I just made some beef stew the other night. Now, the organization primarily serves black artists, but they work to help anyone in need, whether they be homeless, older adults, or even single parents. 
We had one girl, uh, what was her name, Brittany? Brittany, that's, that, that's all I can remember. She had four kids and was homeless. While Chicago musician Ronnie Baker Brooks has not received aid, he's seen its impact firsthand. Music is inspirational, and if you get so disgusted, how can you be creative? You know what I mean? Or it's so negative all the time, that's all you're going to talk about. That's all you're going to sing about. So you, it's very important that we support each other and inspire. But it doesn't stop there. I didn't form this organization just for food and just for uh, uh, money. I formed this organization because I have a dream. I have a vision. I want to put up a building in Bronzeville that will house musicians if they get on bad luck. This is my dream now. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And Black Musicians Matters continues to serve artists on an as-needed basis. Visit our website for more information on how to receive that aid. And that's our show for this Sunday night. Join Paris Shuts tomorrow at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.